Hello, my name is Hazan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast. It's a bonus episode this week. Uh, occasionally, I go on other podcasts, and I get interviewed by other hosts. And this week, I want to share with you an interview that we did with uh, Doug Thorpe. And uh, it was for his show, Leadership Powered by Common Sense. You should go check out that podcast on Apple, Spotify, and everywhere you pick up podcasts. Uh, on our conversation uh, today, we will discuss intentional leadership, uh, reading literature to learn about leadership, which is typically what you tune into this podcast for, and the language dichotomies in leadership, problem solving, and motivation. Now, this podcast was originally recorded back in December of 2022. That's why I'm recording this intro now. Uh, but I do think that it sets a tone uh, and it matches, actually, the direction that we are going on this podcast uh, this year, which is the direction of leaders taking action, but not doing it accidentally, instead doing it intentionally. So please uh, check out all of the information about leadership powered by common sense in the show notes below the podcast player on whatever podcast player it is you are looking at this uh this is not looking at listening <laughs> to this on and uh of course go and connect with doug thorpe in all of the places that you would typically connect with doug thorpe on such as linkedin twitter facebook and instagram enjoy the episode You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Hello again, everyone. You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense. I'm your host, Doug Thorpe, and today I've got a, a very interesting guest. Uh, I have had just a, a, a world of uh, fun and excitement getting to know him. His name is Asan Sorrells. Uh, you're out of California, is that right? Do I remember that correctly? No, uh, no, a little bit, a little bit further uh, east of that. I am out of uh, the Dallas Fort Worth metro. Oh, Dallas! Why, how could I miss that? I'm yeah. Texan from neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I think that? I don't know. Um, hmm. yeah, that's well. Okay. Pardon, pardon, apologies for that. But uh, first, before we dive into the subject matter, uh, give us a little bit of your background and some of your pedigree and experience. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for having me uh, having me on the show today. Um, I love the title of the show, Leadership Powered by Common Sense, and hopefully we can break down some common sense today um, and get some leadership solutions for folks. So uh, so thank you very much, Doug. Uh, yes, for those of you who are listening, my name is Hassan Sorrells. Um, I am the CEO of HSCT Publishing. We are a publishing company that's also a training and development company and a content development company. So we engage in training and development uh, for small and medium-sized businesses in the space of leadership and organizational effectiveness and talent management. We also publish books um, and we make podcasts. So I'm the host of the Leadership Lessons for the Great Books podcast, as well as being the author of my third book, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation of Intentional Leadership. And uh, I have a long career in higher education. I was an adjunct professor and an administrator for almost 20 years. And I brought all of that to the space of entrepreneurship around this leadership space because quite frankly, I believe fundamentally that most of our problems in the world can be solved through the effective application of intentional leadership practices and that it has to begin at the bottom up. Very well said, and that's exactly the connect points that Hasan and I share. Um, as just those of you who have been following me know that I really believe in that word intentional and uh, leadership at all levels of all organizations is something the world could use a, a good bit more of as we were sort of uh, segueing in to warm up the show and get it going. Uh, we were having a, a great discussion about current world affairs and without turning this into any kind of political debate one way or the other, 
Um, I think it's safe to say the the world is in need of some really capable leaders to help us tear apart or spread uh, or step away from uh, biased personal agendas and get into some productive solutions to the problems that face us. And in, in some level, at some level, I think anybody that's been a student of leadership would agree that's what a leader helps do, solve problems. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I like it how you keyed it on that word intentionally. Um, I think we have to lead. I think that leaders who are listening to this have to lead with their brain on, right? You can't lead with your brain off. I also think that leaders have to lead in spite of their position, not because of it, right? So I don't care if your title, you're listening out there, I don't care if your title is manager, your title is supervisor. Um, I don't care if your position is in the C-suite or in the middle of the organization or at entry level. You are right now the avatar for leadership in America today. Um, if you're listening to this, if you're within the sound of my voice, you are the change agent, uh, not the president of the United States, not your congressperson, not your senator, not even your local mayor. Most of the people who are following you on your work teams, most of the people who you are trying to get uh, things done with <laughs> on a regular basis, they have zero clue who the president of the United States is. They don't know. They don't even know, who, they don't even know who's on their own school board, many of them, but they know who you are. And they are looking at you all of the time and they are expecting you to lead. And so our products and services help people like you become better leaders. But we come on podcasts like this as well, because this is another way to spread the word about how important this is leading with your brain on. Now, I, I want to kind of delve into something here, and for the benefit of the leaders, I've had the the opportunity to to talk with Asan several times, and what I find fascinating, this man is an incredible student. He is a voracious reader. He can cite and quote some some of the greatest volumes that possibly have ever been written. But I think what's even more important, and I, I do want to get into this, is the learning and conclusion that comes from that experience and the dialogue it can help create. Mm -hmm. And you've got a community, right, of people that have likewise shared the following of your books and, and the recommended readings. Mm -hmm. And you've got a process as you go through with some people to kind of uh, boy, I I think it, I'm just thinking in my mind it's an insult to call it a book club because it's, <laughs> I, it's, it sure sounds like a whole lot more than that. Yeah, it is. It is way more than that. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons why I decided to do a podcast is because um, a I did a podcast previously. I uh, did it for many many years when podcasting was hard, when it was difficult, um, when you had to do it over Skype, <laughs> and you had to you had to be really really good with the equipment and really really good with the editing. And so I stopped that for a few years, and I can't, I was drawn back in by this fundamental idea that reading and understanding literature is better than trying to read and understand yet another business book. And let me frame this out for you a little bit. If I'm reading Jane Austen. I'm understanding as much about emotional intelligence, if not more, than whatever Daniel Goleman is writing in his great book, Emotional Intelligence. So what our business books do for us is they provide a scaffold, right? They provide a scaffold of understanding. And actually, it just this, this is coming to me as an example right now. They're providing a, a scaffold of understanding, kind of like the... Um, and this is close to uh, close to Halloween. We're doing this episode here, so you know, kind of like a bone, kind of like a, the bones of the skeleton, right? Um, but if you really want to get the muscles and the meat and the skin, and you want to make that thing come alive, you got to read fiction. Um, this is what uh, fiction, military biographies, uh, philosophy. Uh, this is what reading those types of volumes does. It puts it puts flesh on those bones, right? Um, and it gives. It gives depth and breadth and weight to ideas that might seem very intellectual and very reasonable, but you need the emotional content to sort of access those. So you get that emotional content from Shakespeare. Um, if you don't believe me, and we were just talking about, you know, uh, leadership here, um, in talking about leadership here, political leadership, right? 
if you believe that somehow in the early part of the 20th, the 21st century, that politicians have, have become venal overnight, uh, just go look at Macbeth. <laughs> Macbeth will teach you differently. Uh, so will Othello or King Lear, by the way. All right. Um, if you want to learn about emotional intelligence, you're going to want to read Persuasion by Jane Austen, or you're going to want to read um, Emma, right? You're going to want to read something from the Bronte sisters. Um, you're also going to want to read Virginia Woolf for a critique of all of that. And finally, of course, you're going to want to read Nietzsche because that gives you a framework philosophically for the kinds of issues that we are facing right now in the world today. We cover all those books on our podcast. We read them, we pull them apart. Um, and you're right, it's not a book club, nor is it an audio book. It's a way to get leaders to critically think about these ideas without them necessarily always having to read the whole book. It, you said a key word there that's also, a, perhaps I'd call it a pet peeve, the, the notion of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. I am very concerned about our society in general in terms of educating younger generations coming out of school with no coaching development or ability to be a critical thinker mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's kind of like the, you know the, the the thoughts they accumulate are in a large part nothing more than something they found on the internet or mm -hmm. electronically otherwise and to pose a challenge of all right here are two choices. What's the best choice for you? Not that either would be wrong, but what's the best choice? We, we all need a degree of the ability to be critical thinkers. We have to comprehend the question, right? We have to understand what's being asked or we have to comprehend the context because you really didn't ask me a question there. You just provided a piece of context, right? And now I'm responding uh, to the context. But the only way I can, uh, can respond to the context is if, A, I have an attention span that's longer than a hummingbird's, which <laughs> we know that attention spans have declined. I have the ability to focus and totally, completely dial into what you are saying. I have the discipline to um, reign in my mind because the, the greatest place of noise is my own head, right? It's, it's really not social media. It's actually my own head. And then the other skill set that I have to have, and by the way, I have to do all these at the same time, is I have to actually comprehend and contextualize the words that are coming out of your mouth. Yeah. And finally, I have to emotionally care about connecting with Doug. And by connecting with Doug in this context, I'm also caring about connecting with Doug's listeners. Those are all acts of leadership. And what concerns me, beyond merely the lack of critical thinking, and that is concerning, or the decline in it, which, you know, people will say, historians will say, or people who are more historically minded who are listening to this will say, well, people have been complaining about the decline of critical thinking since like newspapers, you know, at least, right? Or even radio, right? I'll, I'll spot you that. Absolutely. I'll spot you that argument. Um, the thing that is concerning to me is that where is, where does the lack of focus and lack of awareness, where does that wind up at? And Leading a mob might be leadership, but it's not positive leadership. And we don't need more people leading mobs and we don't need more ideologues. We need more conversationalists. We need more relationship builders. We need more connection builders. We need more community builders. And by the way, not only on the internet or via a podcast or via an online community, but in real life where real things happen, where real things matter. That's where we need it to. And so the decline in focus, the decline in awareness, decline in the discipline um, to uh, to engage in that is, is definitely very concerning. However, uh, our podcast, your podcast, is part of a leading edge of people who are really using this technology to push back against that and say, no, you know, you can't get a bunch of information from a 60 second video. You have to sit and discipline yourself to listen to an hour long conversation. And so we're, no. we're actively in that space of pushing back against that. And that's what we should be doing. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And I, and I do think and it, it is definitely an element of leadership to be the mind and 
perhaps voice that's helping guide the critical thinking. And if it's, if it's looking at a team and trying to lead them through critical thinking so that they can become better at their jobs or, or, you know, better employees or better volunteers for whatever cause they're in. I have a favorite question. I often ask my executive clients, we'll be talking about an, an interaction between the boss and one of the employees. And I will say, are you leading or are you just solving problems? And the, the basis of that often comes from the fact that if you look at the career path of most of our so-called business leaders, they got promoted the first time to be a supervisor because what? They were the perceived best contributor on the team. Mm -hmm. Best salesman, best administrator, best accountant, best engineer, whatever. So they got anointed to be supervisor mm -hmm. and they went into double down work mode. Well, I got promoted because I worked hard and I was good. So I'm going to work harder and be good. Plus oversee these people. And guess what? They usually get promoted again for having done that. Well, that starts to enforce a behavior, whether it's appropriate or not, where it's that doer mentality. So even at upper middle management, I still see people wanting to dive in and solve whatever problem is presented to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why when I'm working with those, I will ask them the question, are you just solving a problem or are you leading the person? Mm -hmm. And by leading, I mean coaching, teaching, mentoring, modeling, how to solve that problem. Yes, you might know how to solve it better than they would, but it's, it's the old uh, give a man a fish, teach a man to fish kind of thing. It's the challenge of delegating, right? Um, and that's you know, at a tactical level. That's probably the lowest level, you know, of, uh, of what you're talking about. But yeah, you know, if you are, if you are looking at leadership as a solution to a problem, then of course you're going to dump into problem solving, right? Um, because it's the only hammer you have and everything that you see around you is a nail. If instead you're looking at leadership in a multifaceted way and you're looking at it shift and change. So if you have a team of four people, that's four different modes of leadership that you're automatically going to dump into. You, you don't, you don't have a choice around that because that's four mm -hmm. different personalities, uh, four different <clears throat> emotional states, four different ways of looking at the world and perspectives, uh, four different temperaments and personalities talking about the big five factors, right? Uh, you might have one person who's highly open, another person who's low in agreeableness, another person who's high in anxiety and neuroticism, like you're going to be all over the map, right? And as a leader, the ability to care enough to answer that question is what's key. I, I, I find that that's, I mean, it's an excellent question. And it's, and the, the sub question of that is, do you care enough to know the difference? Do you care enough to know the difference between leadership and problem solving? Because if you're being paid to solve problems, you're probably not going to care enough to be a leader. And if you're paid to lead, solving problems will happen automatically. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe we're rocking along here, but uh, looking at the clock on the wall, I need to take a short commercial break here, Asan, and we'll um, uh, come right back. We've got a lot more to pack in here, folks, so hang with us, and we'll be back right after this short message. Business is all about solving complex problems as fast as you can create them. Become the best problem solver by leading others to greatness, too. And the first step is going to DougThorpe.com. Doug Thorpe is known globally for coaching entrepreneurs and business leaders, improving their performance and the work output of everyone surrounding them. You can find health, wealth, and happiness by learning to lead others to health, wealth, and happiness. Go to DougThorpe.com now and order Doug's books or hire him to coach your managers. That's Doug, T-H-O-R-P-E.com. All right, everyone, we're back. This is Leadership Powered by Common Sense, and we are having a deep dive discussion about that thing, leadership. And uh, my guest is Asan Sorrells. He's um, 
got his own podcast, written a couple of books. And one of the things that he and I had talked about offline, and I would like to get into to start this second half, there's a kind of language that tends to uh, flow with a leader, and, and every leader may adopt their own language. But you've got a very specific thought or observation that you're studying right now. So could you share what that is with everybody? Yeah, so as we go into the month of November um, on the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, we are reading books about warfare. We're reading military biographies. So um, biographies of um, William Tecumseh Sherman and Ulysses S. Grant, because I'm a big buff, I'm a big Civil War buff. I can always read stuff about the Civil War. I'm hugely interested in that. Um, by the way, uh, for those of you who are Civil War buffs out there, Grant was better than Lee. And don't send Doug any of your emails. You can send those to me. Now, <laughs> then we have um, we have about face, um, which, was, who, which was written by Colonel David Hackworth, um, a gentleman who uh, began serving in the military. I believe was uh, seventeen years old at fifteen. He signed up for the Merchant Marines, but he really started at seventeen in the Korean War, and it tracks his. Um, his work and his life in um, leadership and in the military all the way through to the Vietnam War and his adventures with the Pentagon, trying to get them to do better leadership and trying to change the bureaucracy of the Pentagon. And finally, we are wrapping up the month, or we're not we're wrapping up the month, we're beginning the month with um, uh, the book by E.B. Sledge, which documents the Battle of Peleliu and Okinawa uh, with the Old Breed, uh, the book that uh, the Pacific was made out of uh, that was co-produced by Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg on HBO a few years ago. In reading these books, one of the major insights that we are exploring is this idea of the dichotomy in language where leaders will use and they will leverage language of warfare we're going to battle our competitors. We're going to carpet bomb the competition. We're going to um, we're going to attack them. Right? Leaders often leaders who are focused on solving problems, by the way, will often use this language to attempt to motivate their followers. And very often these leaders have had zero military experience. Um, the statistics bear this out. Less than 1% of the available male population in the United States currently has served. Less than 1% of the available male population in the United States currently serves in the military. Which means the vast majority of male leaders and female leaders, let's not leave the ladies out, have never actually had a bullet whiz past their head. And yet they are using the language of people they are using the language borrowed from memoirs and movies to stand in for an experience and seeking to motivate people leveraging something that they don't understand now the people who have actually had a bullet whiz past their head and we're going to have a couple of them on the podcast this month people who actually have served in iraq afghanistan in the 20 years of wars that we've had in military actions those people don't use the language of warfare to motivate people because they understand something fundamental they understand that you must be careful with the language of warfare when you are negotiating with people. Conflict is not war. It's something else. And so we are exploring that gap between leaders experience and the language that they use. And um, I think it's incumbent upon civilian leaders in particular, leaders who have no experience in warfare to be cautious in all of the kinds of language that they use, but most importantly, the language of warfare. That's a very interesting concept. And as I shared when we were offline, you know, I'm I'm ex military commission army officer and went through all the training and I had a very unique time of of in service when uh, for a very brief three and a half year period we were in no conflict anywhere in the world mm -hmm. and that was my time on active duty <laughs> so hey, i did a really old, good job <laughs> you know my old history professor said in the long course of history sometimes it's better to be lucky than good <laughs> uh but that doesn't uh eliminate the reality that i I did go through live fire training, so I do know what a bullet flying past your head sounds like. It was about two feet over our head when, you know, we were doing it. And um, so there, there is a reality there. And I have not thought about it as articulately as, as you've just described it, but I have definitely had that observation 
that those bona fide ex-military leaders that are now in civilian roles are very reticent to use any of the terminology that we use in preparation or execution of battle. Mm -hmm. Because we do know what you're doing in business is not that. It's not that. And and if you're framing it in that way, <clears throat> again, with a intention, right? Uh, folks who are very deep into um, social justice uh, uh, philosophy will often talk about intention versus impact. Okay, we can use some of that framing. Um, if your intention is to motivate people, the impact of that language though may not be motivating, it may actually be demotivating. That, that, that's the first thing. Then the second thing is just like when a trauma occurs to a person, repeated trauma eventually dulls you to whatever the trauma it is and it actually occurred in the first place. And so repeated use of the language eventually loses its power, causes that language to lose its power. I believe that leaders who have their brains turned on, once again, intentional leaders who are critically thinking, not only are careful about the language that they use, they understand why they are picking the words they are picking, they pick the words that they choose intentionally, and they are careful and judicious in their language. They're not willy-nilly uh, Pache, Elon Musk, or Donald Trump. They're not tweeting. <laughs> they, are, they are focused on their people, and they are talking to their audience, and they know who their audience is. And so, um, again, I think that average leader who is in a factory in the Midwest, right, or in a tech company in California, um, or in a financial services organization on the East Coast, uh, and who is listening to this, think about your language. That's be my call to action to you today. Think about your language. Think about how your language either motivates or demotivates people, um, and then adjust it accordingly. I think that's very powerful. I, I often share an observation and there's no big scientific study behind this it's it's just my commonsensical approach to the notion of communication and when i talk to leaders about their communication i actually break it down into four parts mm -hmm. first is the idea that's in your head as the leader what is the message that you need to shape form and communicate so it's that thought that's coming out. Then the part number two is your own delivery of it. The words you choose, the method, is it written, is it spoken, is it published, whatever. That can have a breakdown. And as a quick example, you know, how often have any of us said, oh, that didn't come out like I meant it to. So <laughs> we, we have that potential for breakdown just between steps one and two, but then it gets really interesting. Steps three and four are with the receiver, mm -hmm. the person you're trying to communicate with, whether it's an individual or a group, they will have the translation factor, and to your point, the words. Mm -hmm. The words and meaning, and again, simple example, literally in foreign language translation, if you don't do it well, you've got the classic breakdown of community of translation you know lost in translation yep. but but lastly and probably the the real tripping point that leaders suffer from is part number four that's when even if the words get through that step number three filter that the recipient may have they have a process mm -hmm. that they go they process those words and in many cases, the word that ultimately gets passed on becomes a trigger word for negative action or reaction. Mm -hmm. Even though it was never intended that way, mm -hmm. it was part of heritage, experience, and upbringing by the receiver. And that what ought to be an innocent word by many standards is received as something negative and off the mark. Mm -hmm. And... As a leader, I argue that it is incumbent on you to pay attention to all four parts. Yes, absolutely. Um, and this is where you get into the gasoline of social media. 
right. this, this is where you get into that gasoline on that fire on that fire and when someone is triggered and, and and look if you're listening to this and you're a leader we're not saying that you're responsible for the triggering you, you can't possibly be people are too deep and complex that are your followers remember they're individuals not a mass right but you are responsible for the first three pieces of that <laughs> yeah um <clears throat> you're also responsible for the channel through which um that communication flows right um, my mouth is a channel um my my fingers uh, on the keyboard the digital keyboard you know uh, and, and twitter is easy to pick on so let's pick on facebook <laughs> you know putting it on facebook you know that's or or in a text message to someone um or in an email right um that's a channel right you are responsible for those channels and i think that not i think through our reading we know that the best leaders think critically about these channels and they think about every single layer of that sandwich we also know that we now live in a space where and, and this is something very important to keep in mind everyone regardless of whether you want to be or not is a media company and being a media company means it doesn't mean you have a podcast it doesn't mean that um you're doug or myself we accept being in the media that's a place where we've 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 planted our flag or we're making a footprint or, or whatever however you want to frame that what i mean is you're a media company to your followers now you're a media company to your friends and family there are 50 people and usually it's around 50 who care very much about what comes out of your mouth and when they are triggered that is where the blowback will be the strongest yeah i agree with you on the, the that part for the trigger you you're not ultimately responsible for that but where where i put it in the domain of of influence is that when you see the triggering has created a less than desirable response mm -hmm. as a leader you've got you can't stop and let that go you have to embrace it right. even if it's something like on the spectrum of Oh, I'm sorry. That seems to have really hit you wrong. Tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you're feeling. And perhaps I can rephrase it. Perhaps I can clarify. Perhaps I can. And if you're telling me you're outright offended by it, I am sorry. That was not the, that was not the point. <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. Well, and you know what? That requires um, a certain measure of humility um that requires you to put down your ego as a leader and understand that you know you might have gotten this wrong right um you might have missed the mark you might have committed hamartia which is by the way the greek word for <laughs> an older word uh sin <laughs> in the new testament you might have missed the mark by the way that's an archery term interesting ideas to line up there for just a moment but um if you have missed that mark if you haven't hit the target you got to acknowledge that and you know um there's a lot of leadership consultants who talk about accountability and responsibility fundamentally i believe accountability is something that is usually done to you whereas responsibility is something you take up for yourself because there's mm -hmm. a measure of autonomy in responsibility whereas with accountability it's almost an act that's foisted upon you and we can talk about that if <laughs> we can talk about that in another there's another, another whole show another we're gonna have to do. <laughs> exactly just about that um but um but at the end of the day um leaders are accountable so they do have to take on that weight and they have to be responsible right and anything that's in your sphere of influence as a leader congratulations it's your fault uh that's the nature of the beast that's the nature of leading now does that mean that there's nowhere for you to put it down uh no it doesn't uh caesar has to have a place to lay his head uh we read julius caesar interestingly enough on the podcast uh, a few months ago and uh, that was one of the points that uh, shakespeare made when caesar all of the time is just caesar well now he's driven by pride and arrogance and ego and a lack of humility and he can't even get feedback from his own wife to not go down to the senate and see Brutus <laughs> yeah. with terrible outcomes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, let me, in, in the little bit of time we've got left here, I want to ask you one of the age old questions that I know swirls around academics and um, in, in some of the big business schools. Are leaders born or bred? Both. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, yeah, the perennial question. We don't even bother answering this question anymore. <laughs> um, no, I, I personally fundamentally think that it's both. I believe that temperament and training uh, need to happen at the same time. Are some people temperamentally going to be more extroverted, higher in extroversion, uh, higher in openness, and, and higher in conscientiousness? Yes. Are they going to make um, what would be maybe the, the classical, you know, outgoing leader? Sure, they're going to do that. But you're also going to have people who are um, lower in um, openness, right? Who are lower in extroversion or more introverted. Susan Cain writes about this in her book, The Quiet Mind, right? Um, and they are going to make great leaders too. And the mistake that we make is we confuse the temperament for the impact of the training. And we confuse the, the, the presence of the temperament for the ability to, Im, to implement what comes out of development and training. And we should not confuse those two. So it's actually both. It's both things. It's both uh, born and made. And fortunately, what that means is that everyone can learn to be a leader, but everyone may not have the temperament to lead, which is a fundamental difference. And we talk yeah. about that even in my book. Yeah. No, I, I like that. And and for the record, I happen to agree with you. I think it's a both. Um, I think definitely leadership can be coached and taught and people can embrace principles of and elements of becoming an effective influencer and inspirer of people. And, you know, that's kind of the core elements of what you want to see from a leader can can you influence some thinking and inspire people to go a new way well and and i'll just tack this on at the end as the industrial revolution has broken down and as the internet has flattened everything right um what has happened is that fragmentation has produced only in america now i'm going to keep this very narrow has produced what, quite frankly, 330 million versions of leadership. That's what yeah. the internet has produced. Yeah. No longer is there a mass idea. And don't get me wrong, there are people who are going to go on the Mount Rushmore of leadership, the Ken Blanchards and the Tony Robbins and the Zig Ziglers of the world. They're going to, they're going to go on, or if they haven't, and if they haven't gone on, they're already on um, the Mount Rushmore of Le Jack Canfield. They're going to be on the Mount Rushmore of leaderships. But those are the guys, and, and they almost are all guys, uh, those are the people who uh, came from a time of a mass understanding of leadership, where it was mass movements and mass people that had to move in one direction. And that's what leadership was for 120 years. And we're at the end of that. We are now in a space of fragmentation. We are now in a space where, quite frankly, how you define leadership for yourself and how I define leadership for myself really has to match to our team that's immediately in front of us. And that's not going to look the same across all planes and across all times. And many of us are old enough to remember mass. I'm, I was born at the tail end of mass. And so I, I, can't, I grew up with some of that and it is frustrating. Why can't all these people just <laughs> go in the same direction together? But at the same time, that's not the world that we live in today, nor quite frankly, will it be the world that uh, my five-year-old will be operating in in uh, in 2030 or 2040 or 2050 or right. 2060 or 2070 and so we need new models and i'm not talking about you know situational models or servant leadership models i'm not talking about a formal framing we need models that are going to fit each individual and that's an incredible journey to be on yeah i agree with you and I think on that note, we're going to wrap this up. But Asan, thank you so much for being here. Tell everybody the best way to get in touch with you if they're interested in learning more. Awesome. Thank you very much, Doug, for having me on Leadership Powered by Common Sense. I think we got to some common sense solutions here for folks. And uh, I want to thank you for giving, giving me the ability to come on your platform and talk to your audience today and keep doing the great work that you're doing. If people want to connect with me, they can 
always, of course, connect with me on social media. So I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Um, I'm, of course, well, I have a Twitter account, but I don't ever use it. So don't even bother trying to get me there <laughs> um, or on Instagram. If you want to connect with me, though, LinkedIn is the best place to do that. And you can just Google, you can just LinkedIn my name, Hassan Sorrells, and I pop right up there at the top. I'm the only one there is. Of course, you could visit our website at leadershiptoolbox.us where we feature our leadership toolbox, which features 12 modules of leadership content, um, including coaching, by the way, to help your organizational, your organizational leaders, well, basically get better, right? Turning managers and supervisors into leaders. You can also check out our podcast, the leadership lessons from the great books on all the major podcast platforms that you are on. We're on Spotify right next to Joe Rogan. So you can find us there, uh, or, you know, any place else. <laughs> and of course, if you want to pick up our book, uh, my book, 12 rules for leaders, the foundation of intentional leadership that's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and everywhere you buy books. Yeah, very good. Well, folks, we'll have all that in the show notes. So, uh, don't worry if you miss some of that on the fly, but you're uh, welcome to drop down, check out the show notes here, and you'll get all those links. But uh, again, Asan, thank you for being here. I do want to remind everybody that if you're listening to this show on your favorite streaming service, we do have a video version over on YouTube, channel by the same name. Just hop over there, subscribe to the channel if you will, check out uh, all the episodes that we've had. You'll get a lot of snippets and the good ideas. And uh, I invite people to leave us a comment, give us some feedback, uh, subscribe. You'll get notices about when new episodes are coming out and things we're working on. And most importantly, if you or someone you know might be interested in being on the show and something we've said today has inspired a thought or, or hit a nerve, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll be happy to entertain that. And you can check out all those also links for my information in the show notes. You can get a hold of me and we'll put that together for you. But for now, we're going to sign off, say goodbye, and thank you very much for participating. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.